this is Gilbert Gottfried, and I'm here with my co-host Frank Santo Padre, and this is another edition of Gilbert and Frank's Amazing Colossal Obsession. Colossal Obsessions. What a pro he is, Dennis. <laughs> It's his marks every time. It took him 28 weeks to get the names of the show right. But he's good. <laughs> yeah. He's got it now. And our guest today <laughs> is Dennis Perrin. Now, Dennis. Oh, Dennis. Oh, Dennis. <laughs> yes, Mr. Godfrey. <laughs> Did you grow up hearing that? Oh, Dennis. Oh, oh well, Jack no. Benny. Actually, it was Dennis the Menace. It was Jay North. Oh, huh? It was a big Jay North thing, and I hated it. Dennis is here with us. Dennis is an old friend, and he is also he's an author. He's a journalist. He's a comedy writer. He is the author of Mr. Mike, the life and work of Michael O'Donoghue, uh, the legendary yes. comedy writer. Absolutely. Um, did Afont you remember, Tarib. Huh? Afont Tarib. And, and then some. Um, the Netflix movie aired. Gilbert, have you seen the uh, the new National Lampoon movie? The, uh, the the one where Joel McHale's playing Chevy? Uh, no. A futile and stupid gesture? You have to see it. Oh, wow. It's one of those movies. I was telling Dennis this on the phone. Gilbert loves these things with the weird alternate universes. Yeah, sure. Well, We talked about how in Man on the Moon. Oh, yes. There's no Danny DeVito. Yeah, no Danny DeVito in he's Taxi. Playing his, yeah, right. Right. But in this one, uh, Chevy Chase exists, but there's no Martin Mull. Because right. Martin Mull's playing Doug Kenny. Right. Martin Mull's A playing, fantasy Doug Kenny. A fantasy Doug Kenny. Had he lived. Yeah, had he lived. And look like Martin Mull. And uh, I'm going to make Gilbert watch and, it. And and I got to experience myself. I'm in it for a second in this terrible Robert De Niro film called The Comedian, where oh, yeah. I'm listed as Gilbert Gottfried. And I thought, oh, here's a universe where Gilbert Gottfried exists, but <laughs> Robert De Niro doesn't exist. That, that always stands out in movies. Yeah, this is one of those movies where it, it's very, very strange. Well, it's, it's a movie. It's weird. I'm the worst audience for it because I'm so close to the material. Of course. And I help work on the book that it's based on, the book that Frank is holding. Josh's book. Josh Carp. Josh Carp is a yeah. good friend of mine, a, a writer, journalist, lawyer. I think, he, I think he makes more money in law, which is a wise mm, Good thing. for him. Something you fall back Smart. on. And... Um, and I knew Josh through a guy named Mike Gerber, who's uh, American bystander, Mike, American Michael bystander Gerber. which I've yeah. written for several times. Yeah. And uh, Mike's an old SNL Weekend Update writer from the uh, Tina Fey, Jimmy Fallon days. That's right. I believe. Yeah. That's so, right. Um, but uh, were you a consultant too on the film? Did I mean, no, no, this... no. I mean, I, I I knew it was happening. I uh, met with Tom Lennon, Thomas Lennon. Right. You know played, Thomas who, Lennon, Gil, Gil, he plays the uh, he plays Felix on The Odd Couple, to, uh, the new Odd Couple, to Matthew which Perry's Oscar. Got canceled. Oh. Yeah. And he was in the state. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Right, right, right. And he played Michael O'Donoghue. And I, I was out in L.A. and uh, for a variety of other reasons, you know, my, my work with, uh, with children. And uh, I just happened to be in town. And uh, uh, Tom invited uh, me and my better half Laura Geyer who's in the other room uh and he wanted Hi, to talk about O'Donoghue he'd read my book and he was playing him he played him in the movie right so we talked about it but you know I I really wasn't sure what he was going to do and whatnot and yeah. I I used to write for Lampoon basically you did right before it died well, we Dennis and I were talking about this on the phone. You were you weren't there under Tim Matheson you were there uh, under yeah Tim Matheson was there I was there with also the original, uh, the brothers. Oh, the Simmons brothers. The Simmons brothers. Oh, the brothers. Simmons and Michael Andy. Simmons. Yeah, yeah, I right. was there with them. And then later on came... Uh, came uh, Matheson. He came Matheson, in. Matheson, Because right. of the Animal House connection. Right. And I know Ratso, Larry Ratso, Ratso Sloman was, was involved it. with it. In the '80s, at some point, but I'm not quite sure. When. You were think, doing you were doing photo funnies and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did a, a few articles, and then basically I realized, hey, it uh, I I don't have to really write anything all that funny, and I could be photographed with naked curls right. all day. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to do photo funnies. Yeah. 
I remember. I remember seeing you in those. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I miss that part of the Lampoon's history. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was in Marrakesh or something. I don't know. I was. Uh, it's, it, it's a strange movie to watch. The device of using Martin Mull, obviously Doug Canny, the founder of the Lampoon, the co-founder of the Lampoon, only lived to the age of 33. Right. He died and in 1980. He died tragically in, in Hawaii. He, he jumped? Well, off a mountain? Unknown. They don't know whether he jumped or he slipped. It was the Harold Ramis line that uh, right. Doug uh, slipped when he was looking for a place to jump. Yeah. <laughs> and in the movie, they strongly implied that he jumped. Because they, they showed the, 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 the glasses, the eyeglasses. The glasses and, and the, his shoes at the edge the of the shoes. cliff. Like he laid yeah. it there. Yeah. So it would be found. He, he, it's fair to say he was depressed over Caddyshack. He hated Caddyshack. Yeah, he got, which he wrote. When they had the presser at Dangerfields with the whole cast of... Uh, uh, Ted Knight and Bill Murray and Chevy right, and right. Rodney, um, he showed up really drunk and had to be removed because he was just saying, this is a piece of shit. What are you people doing here? And they dramatized that in the movie. That's the thing about the movie. It's like this hyper real sort of almost tongue in cheek take on the early Lampoon years in the early 70s. But then it has a tonal change. Like, it's like, you know, it's really tongue in cheek. And Martin Mull even says to the camera, well, you know, none of these people are look like the people they're playing. They're not even attempting to do a, a I real imitation of that was a smart them. move. Well, because, <laughs> had to I mean, it. it was obvious. Right, they I mean, had to call you know, they, attention they, they to it. They had to call, I, I don't know what their budget was, so, you know, they were kind of limited, I suppose, in that respect. But but, um, but then there was this tonal change of when Doug Kenny got, got Animal House, uh, did Animal House and made a lot of money and became yeah. went out to L.A. and he got involved with cocaine and just went nuts and the whole Caddyshack thing, which he he did not like Caddyshack, and it was really kind of an amateurish production because Harold Ramis's first movie as a right. director, and they forced the 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 uh, the, 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 the groundhog gopher, or whatever the, the gopher the gopher on him. Yeah, the, the which yeah. turned out to be the most popular character in the movie. Go figure. But and they and they actually dramatized the thing where he and his girlfriend Catherine Walker go to see Airplane. Right. And Doug Candy gets really mad because he says, oh, man, this is so much better than Caddyshack. You know, I mean, people are they're going to love this movie and hate my movie. And Airplane is a, actually is a better movie, actually, in terms of comedy. I mean, Caddyshack eventually, you know, got its due. And They say I, that I, in the I, wake scene. They hit Martin Mull's character yeah. says, and, you know, and, and here's a twist. Uh, uh, Caddyshack will later become a beloved movie. Yeah, yeah. Which, of course, he never lived to see. No. I mean, I'm not a big Caddyshack fan. I never was. I thought it was a very uneven film, especially coming off Animal House, which is impossible to top. Absolutely. I mean, you, that's your first movie, and it becomes the highest grossing American comedy ever, and John Belushi's in it. It makes everybody stars. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, what's, what's your next movie? And it's like, I don't know. We're going to do something at a golf course. You know, and he hooked up with Harold Ramis again and Brian well, Doyle they were, Murray. They were loopers, bro, the, the Murray brothers. Yeah, I think that was right. the, the genesis of, that's right. of Caddyshack. That's right. They, and they were, filmed it. They were teen they filmed caddies. It the, yeah, they filmed it at the same time as the Blues Brothers because Brian McConaughey, who was a Lampoon writer and SNL writer and, uh, among other things, SCTV, he uh, plays a small role in Caddyshack. And uh, he was talking about how the two films were, like, checking up on each other because... Ackroyd and Belushi were in Chicago shooting Blues Brothers, and they were in Florida shooting Caddyshack. And it was like the SNL, because Bill Murray was down there in Chevy, so it was like the SNL graduates, you know, these were their movies, and it was like competing. And, I mean, and what was your feeling about Caddyshack 2? <laughs> Jackie Mason stole it. Jackie, Ma okay. Jackie Mason stole it, and, of course, the scene where they had, and, and, you know, and Dan Aykroyd, I think he's playing, like, Bill Murray's even more retarded brother or cousin, mm -hmm. like the groundskeeper. Yeah. It, 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 it's really, it's quite, it's quite a bad film. We, we learned recently that Dangerfield was pissed off at Jackie Mason. Oh, really? For yeah, for taking the part. And Chevy did it. Was, they brought yeah, Chevy Chevy's in for, in like, there. three days or something. Robert Stack. Robert Stack plays uh, the Ted Knight role. Yeah. Have you seen Caddyshack too? Did you oh, sit, did you oh, sit yes. through that from start to finish? Yeah, yeah. That and and what's what's funny about it is that it was obvious that the Randy Quaid part oh, was sorry. written for Sam Kinison. Yeah, because it's Sam Kinison type screaming. Did you know that, Dennis? No, I did not. Yeah. That's news. Going. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and it's so it's it's basically Randy Quaid yelling out lines yeah. written for Sam Kinison. Yeah, 
Tell, tell us about O'Donoghue. Now, O'Donoghue becomes, obviously, he's a, he's a very important figure in the history of the Lampoon. Well, he's an important figure in the movie. Yeah, I mean, Michael O'Donoghue was really, he put, he, he's the one who gave the Lampoon its voice. You know, and sex, for people that don't sex rem- and violence and death. And, you for know. our listeners, just to jog their memories, he was Mr. Mike. Mr. Mike Marathon, on Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night the original Live. Saturday Night Live. He wore very years. dark glasses. He told very twisted children's stories. He did and, impressions. And, and he did impressions of putting steel needles in his eyes. And <laughs> you know, uh, which ran out of steam rather quickly. Um, but uh, my he, favorite he kept was doing the Mormon it. Tabernacle Choir. With that was the apex. By, yeah. by knitting, and like and Michael O'Donohue was brought in... I think by Dick Ebersole. We're going to get to that. That's right. You we're jumping. To, we're <laughs> we're going to get to that. But yes, he did. And we're going to get to that. To yeah. put more fight and more life into Saturday Night Danger. Live. Danger. That was after you left. Uh, yes. Right after. Yes. Right after you left. Yeah. After you were asked to leave, I think. Yes. Right after, <laughs> right after I was told, don't let the door hit you on the ass <laughs> quickly, on the way out. Quickly, because he might not know it. Tell Dennis that story of how you were sitting outside of Gene Devanian's oh office. God. You found the fan letter. I, I was there right when the original cast left was uh-huh. my season. And that was... Oh, I know. that. Yeah, that would be like... Uh, like in the mid season of Friends, they got rid of the whole cast and got a bunch of other people and said, Oh, this is the new cast. Just act like the same way you loved, uh, uh, you know, Jennifer Anderson. Love and and all, yeah, yeah right. just accept them. So they hated us before we even made it to the air. Uh, it was impossible, man. It was an, and, impo- it was an impossible mission. And I remember so. Then we, uh, oh, I, I, the funny thing was uh, uh, Gene Domanian was the producer. The Ayatollah oh, yeah. Domanian. Oh, Ayatollah yes. Domanian. The caller. And I remember at one point that I, we were sitting in someone's office. Their office was empty. So I was hanging out there talking with Eddie Murphy. Mm-hmm. And we were just hanging out there. And then somebody pokes their head in. To Eddie and says, oh, uh, Eddie, the so-and-so from NBC would like to talk to you. And he was confused, and he picked up the phone, and he goes, yeah, yeah, oh, shit. No, no, I won't tell anybody. No, no, I'll keep it a secret. And before he even hangs up the phone, he goes, they fired Gene Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, so I... In in a second, everyone knew she was fired, and and then she had to announce to everyone who had to sit there and pretend they didn't know she was fired. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what she tearfully told us this, and to make matters more surreal, it was her birthday, <laughs> and at the end part. of this. This speech where she says, you know, I love all of you and I miss, I'll miss all. Uh, they go, happy birthday. <laughs> and they bring out a cake with the candles burning on it. But and so then a week later, Dick Ebersole comes in and he brings us together and he goes, you know, we're. Just going to make some minor changes. <laughs> don't don't even worry about it. And uh, in a couple of days, I'll tell you what. So a few days later, they were lining us up one after the other outside Dick Ebersold's office to find out what was going to happen. And there was a table that they used to drop all the fan letters on back when they still had fan letters. And and some I pick one up when I'm killing time waiting for him to call me in. And it's some girl from like Omaha. And and I open it up and it says, Dear Gilbert, I'm so sorry about what happened to you. <laughs> and that's how I found out I was fired from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, do we do we want to get into SNL? Or you want to finish the O'Donnell? I just want to finish O'Donnell because okay, I do. Want, I, have a, I have some questions for Gilbert because I've always oh, wanted sure. to ask. Yeah, sure. Yo. I mean, this is an honor for me, and I'm not being sarcastic, really. Yeah, seriously. he watched all 12 episodes. I have them. I own them. He has them. I have them with period commercials. He has. I I wish I had like a medal to give you. Thank you. I I was rewatching some of them before I came here. I'll ask you a couple of questions about O'Donoghue. How 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 that came about? He was a comic, a comedy hero, obviously. Sure. You knew him, and you interacted with him long before you decided to write a book. Well, what happened was I knew him in the last five years of his life. I got to meet him through our producer friend. Uh, Frank Santa Padre, because your manager Barry Secunda my, also my managed manager. And, yeah, That's right. managed O'Donoghue, and I was doing a radio show on WBAI with a media group at the time, and that I was working with here in town, and um, I had been reading. Uh, Michael had been doing some interviews about corporate stranglehold of comedy, and he was like really anti-corporate and everything. And the media show I was doing was focusing on that kind of thing, and so I thought. Two birds, one stone, right? Because I really wanted to meet Michael O'Donoghue, and I thought, well, this is the way I could do it. I have a radio show. So I found out Frank has an in, so I call Frank. Frank calls Barry. Barry calls me. He says, well, what do you want to talk to Michael about? Because he's a very busy man. Of course, he wasn't busy, but, I mean, you know, he's an angry genius in exile, basically. And, you know. He was in exile at that point. He was definitely in exile. And, um Anyway, long story short, I end up talking to Michael. He calls me. I, I, I inter- interested. I got Barry interested enough for Michael to call. So Michael calls and he goes, "Yeah, uh, yeah. What's this about? What do you, uh, uh, what do you want?" I mean, it was just basically like, you know, what the fuck do you want? I said, "Well, Michael, if I may call you that, you know, I mean, I'm a big fan of yours. Like, I was in high school when SNL was on. Blah 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 blah." And he goes, "Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, what?" And I said, you know, one of my favorite sketches of yours came in your, your second stint on SNL. It was with Joe Piscopo and Mary Gross. And it was called Nick the Knock. And he goes, you remember Nick the Knock? And I go, oh, yeah. Joe Piscopo, for our listeners, and maybe even for Gilbert. Uh, it was a sketch that Michael wrote to embarrass Joe Piscopo on television. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Piscopo, the year before was doing the Jersey guy. You know, are you from Jersey? I'm from Jersey. Oh, yeah. yeah, the Jersey guy. So when Michael came into SNL and Joe, obviously, and Eddie, you know, survived, uh, pushed, uh, 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 Piscopo says, well, you know, well, hey, Michael, I do this Jersey character. He goes, we won't be doing that this year. We're not going for those kind of laughs. He goes, but I got a character for you that I like to do. It's a hand puppet. And he's called Nick the Knock. He goes, a hand puppet? He goes, yeah, we're going to have a little puppet set, little curtains, and you're going to play a hand puppet. He goes, okay. So he writes this piece with uh, Pam Norris, who I think wrote for you. Yeah. I think she was on that staff. And uh, it's basically, he plays an idiot puppet who's like, do, 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 I'm Nick the Nug, I'm Nick the Nug, do, 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 you know. <laughs> and he's just like going around this puppet <laughs> stage. And uh, Mary Gross plays this little fairy who comes down to the puppet stage and they chroma key her in. And uh, she's like, Nick, Nick the knock. Oh, you're such a savage boy, but I'm going to, you know, tell you the truth about beauty. And she does this poem like from Tennyson or something. And it's got this beautiful music behind it. And then all of a sudden the puppet door knocks, you know, and he goes, Oh, there's somebody at the door. And he goes to the door and someone hits him with a brick bat and it drives him insane. So he takes the fairy and begins eating her with green blood spurting all over the place. And the curtain closes and it says the end. No laughs from the audience, no applause. In fact, Michael told me, he goes, we actually had the applause lights on and the audience refused to applaud. This aired. Yeah. Wow. And it aired. Yeah, right. It was on the Bernadette Peters show. So he appreciated that you. That he, you- he said, he goes, he goes, I think that aired once. I don't think they ever ran a reruns. I go, no, I didn't. I, I, I remember it. I go, it's one of those images that you just remember, you know, especially if you're a comedy freak. And he said, okay, well, uh, I'll come into your office when you want to talk. So then he came in and I interviewed him and. I did the uh, we I put the tape on the show and he wrote me a beautiful letter and we became friends. And then I began going over to his apartment on 16th Street, the, the famous apartment, the Winter with, Palace, yes, as Ann Beats called it. Yeah, with his glass case with all of his Nazi dolls and <laughs> all the weird uh, yeah, yeah, stuffed all that, animals, so the, the, the cheap perfume collection. Right. 
uh, he had like a hundred identical plastic rhinoceroses. They were all together in a herd. Isn't there an owl? Po- like a like a yeah. Well, he had like stuffed a, animals like a, over there. He had a stuffed yeah, flamingo. Like he had a lot. St- yeah, he yeah. had a stuffed flamingo <laughs> with a with with a with a mask on it. And when you went into Michael's apartment, he'd have a dressing gown or a robe, and he'd smoke his uh, more cigarettes. You know, the thin brown cigarettes between his two fingers, his middle mm-hmm. fingers. And he was a great host. I mean, he was very elegant. He goes, oh, hi. You want some coffee? I just made some coffee. Do you want some coffee? And I was just like, I was out of my mind. I was like, I'm sitting here with Michael O'Donoghue, man. I mean, who the fuck am I? I'm from Lawrence, Indiana, man. I mean, I don't. And we got to be friends. Well, anyway, five years later, he dies uh, in 1994. I went to his wake. Yeah, the famous wake. Cheryl Hardwick yeah, invited me, his, his widow. That's who, the one where, where, where Buck Henry got up and made the... Uh... Mm-hmm. And made the comment after Chevy spoke. Yeah, Chevy got up there, and I didn't know any of these people. I mean, I'd met Michael, and I'd been to a couple of his parties, and I met people like Jan Hooks and people like that. But the originals, I didn't know at all. And Chevy got up there, I remember, and he he had this speech about Michael, and he got some of the things wrong. And Tom Davis, the Franken and Davis, yelled, heckled Chevy, and then uh, Lauren Michaels gets up. And does this little solemn speech about Michael, what Michael meant to the show and all this sort of thing. And then Buck Henry gets up and says, thank you, Chevy. Thank you, Lauren. I think we all know what Michael thought of you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And Mike, cause Michael, uh, Michael and Chevy had a love, hate yeah. forever. And, uh, we had Chevy, when we had Chevy here, he had really very nice sentiment. Chevy worships nice things Michael. about him. And Chevy worships there Michael. were projects that, that they worked on together that right. saw the light of day. Right. Well, he was upset with Chevy because Chevy decided to do foul play with Goldie Hawn instead of making the movie that they were writing together. Right. Was that called the pl- Saturday Matinee? Okay. Uh, which that was the it, Planet of the Special Effects. That was within that. Yes. Right. Right. It was right, a mini right. film within a film. Right. 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 Like Kentucky Fried Movie kind of a thing. And then after he passed, you decided. You were well, write I didn't about decide him. anything. I just said, "Well, that's that," because I figured, you know, okay, I had my time, and I'd never written a book before. I mean, I'd written some small mm-hmm. comic novels that didn't get published, but you know, like my biography. I had no idea. I'd never done that before. And an old girlfriend of mine says, you know, nobody knows O'Donoghue's work better than you do. You should write the book. And I knew he had some famous, kept one person who's dead, but I'll keep his name because he was, I won't say his name because he was a very bitter man to the end. Uh, he assumed he was going to write it because he wrote about him for Rolling Stone. And I called Cheryl out of the blue, who I barely knew. Um, even though I knew Michael, I didn't know Cheryl. His that widow. Well. His widow. Yeah. Who was the, she was the co-musical director for SNL with G.E. Smith. And uh, so I said, uh, Cheryl, I, I would love to write Michael's story, and I want to tell you why. Can I meet with you for coffee or something? And she said, sure. So I go over to the Winter Palace. We're sitting at the long table uh, next to the curios, and I make my speech, my, my pitch, which I don't even remember because I was like out of my mind, you know. And she says, that's it, you're it. And she tagged me, and she says, you're, you're, you'll be the official biographer. And that was it. And so I, I wrote up, a, a, you know, a, um, a prospectus, you know, uh, an outline for it. Got an agent like that, you know, because everybody wanted to see the O'Donoghue book. Got a book deal. It's a good book. It's full of goodies. And, uh, and then Cheryl gave me complete access to his files. I got everything. And so I spent, there was a lot of unpublished stuff. From oh, there's the, a lot. Of, I, I, I had his childhood program. drawings. I mm-hmm. had yeah. the first thing he ever wrote when he was like 10 years old. I had all of it. An interesting guy who was a sickly child. Rheumatic yeah, fever. Rheumatic fever. Yeah. yeah. Did was, you ever he, meet him in your travels, Gilbert? I, if, if I met him, it was very, very briefly. And I never, I, I never quite bought into that whole thing where, I mean... He, you know, when they said, when he announced to the new crew right. Saturday Night Live, well, we're going to do things different. And he took out a spray can yep. and started spraying the walls and threw them spray cans. And I thought, you know, cut this shit. <laughs> Write a funny bit or something. That's when he came back and he wanted to be referred to. How, Dennis? Uh, as Reich Marshall O'Donnell. <laughs> he wanted to be referred to yeah. as Reich Marshall. <laughs> and, and he actually got that title. Yeah. Yeah. I wish you guys had crossed paths. That would really that really well, would have barely. been. Yeah. I mean, you, you barely. Oh yeah. 
I mean, had you I was on my yeah. way out. <laughs> I'd like to say to our listeners that the people who care about this stuff, who care about Lampoon history, who care about Saturday Night Live history, that they should get your book. Because Thank it's you. not only about the there's it's full of goodies, it's full of great stuff. It's not only about the man, but it's there's there's so much stuff in there. Mm-hmm. Things that never saw the light of day, update jokes that never got on the air. A lot of censored material. A lot Michael's, of censored stuff. I had access to all of it. I had all of his weekend update. He had a whole file of weekend update stuff that never yeah, got Yeah, it's used. a treasure trove. It really is. It, it was amazing. I mean, I would I, I keep I kept forgetting I was supposed to be researching a book. Because I'd be sitting on the floor of his file room. Going through all this stuff like a kid. Right. Wow. Finding the old Phoebe yeah. guy stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is great. Stuff. Oh, I'm supposed to be uh, researching this because I was just reading it. Yeah. And, and course, he's, he's in the very first Saturday Night Live sketch. Very first with Hold Belushi. Open, with, with Belushi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to feed your fingertips to the Wolverines. To the Wolverines, yeah. which they recreate in the Lampoon movie. That's right. It's, created, it's recreated for the movie. In the interest of time, what do you want to ask him? Oh, about uh, SNL 80. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well I, I, I loved your movie, by the way. He saw the uh, doc. The, 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 oh, the, thank you very much. Film. I really enjoyed it. Um, and, of course, you came into your own in the 80s, obviously. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I noticed there was like, it, it seemed like Stalinist airbrushing. You didn't mention SNL at all. Oh, 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 he takes issue with the fact that SNL gets no mention in the doc. And, I, oh, and, and yeah. for me... I was in the Midwest. Yeah. I was a kid. You know, when I, I remember when the new cast came on, you mentioned the, f- the Friends analogy, which is perfect because, you know, when they announced the new cast and they, you had, a, I guess, a press conference, they had pictures. Oh, yeah. And I saw the picture in the Indianapolis Star of the new cast of Saturday Night Live. And I go, who the fuck are these people? <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I, <laughs> that was I'm everyone's at reaction. Him, and I'm like, there's a short guy with like a Jewish afro and there's this tall, skinny guy with like wavy hair. And he was the that, only that one girl looks kind of cute. I don't know who she is. It was Ann Risley. Yeah, She's kind of cute. Bill Mathias was cute. Yeah. Gilbert was the only one in the cast I knew. Because I had seen you at the comic strip. Wow! In the, in the, in the but you, '70s. But you and, see, but you see, for me, and I think for a lot of us out there who weren't part of the New York comedy scene at the time, you know, SNL was the first time we saw you, and it wasn't the Gilbert Gottfried, no, obviously, no. that we've come to and, know and, and love. What was funny is the criticism we were getting. Number one, they'd say we don't know who these people are, and I thought, oh, as opposed to internationally known superstars, <laughs> you know, John Belushi, Chevy Chase, who... Nobody you, knew them. You can yeah. see that Tomorrow well, Show see, episode with... You ever see that with oh, yeah, Snyder sure, interviewing sure. the original cast? Absolutely. Yeah. It was right on, before they premiered. YouTube. But the thing is, the, the advantage they had over you guys is that they all worked together for years. Yeah. Like, right. I mean, they, they actually had bonds. Yes. And when Chevy left, they brought in Bill Murray, and Bill Murray was part of that same group. Yeah. And so you they just, weren't they expecting anything... Right. When they came on the air. Right. Well, nobody knew what it yeah. was. But once it became the hit it was, and then you guys came in, suicide mission. Yeah. Absolutely. It's impossible. I know Harry Shearer thought about coming back to Gene Demani, and he said, you know, if you let me bring in, like, Tom Leopold and people like that, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, we, 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 we can make it work. Because he said to her, you know, you, you got to hit the ground running. You're not going to have time to find your way. You know, you've got to come in, and he was going to bring in Christopher Guest, and, and Demanian says, "No, I want to, f- I, I, I want to find new people. I, I want to find my well." And you know, she found her way into a wall. Um, it was a suicide mission. You guys didn't have a chance. It's a fascinating. I, I, I like I said, I, I own all those episodes, uh, and it's interesting. There's some actually some really interesting as you guys started getting your footing a little bit and understanding the process, obviously. Uh, there's some interesting comedy, and actually, there's not some. I mean, there's some some good sketches actually. But 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 you know, who was watching it? Do you have any memory of being in anything good that you're no. proud of? No, <laughs> none whatsoever. I, yeah, I just I remember a lot. What were the What were the writing sessions like? Because I'm curious. Oh God! Well, I, I remember I, talking I, to um, uh, uh, David Sheffield and um, oh, Blaustein, Jerry Blaustein, and they yeah. were telling me some stuff. But I never really got a sense because they were Eddie's guys, right? Yeah. And they came in late. Yeah. So and, um, and I I I always talk about this. I didn't get along with the writers. The writers didn't get along with me. And at one point, they wrote me into a sketch. It was a funeral scene, mm-hmm. 
and I was the corpse. Right. <laughs> I was, right. I was it was uh, you from the writers. It, it, the organist was a sports organist. He was playing, you know, da 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 da. Oh yes, yeah. yes. Right, 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 right. And what was? I, and I got to ask this, and I God bless him. And I actually had been commissioned to write a piece for Playboy, which fell through about the life and death of Charles Rocket. What was Charlie Rocket like? I mean, I, he he looked manic as as the shows go on. You can see him coming undone. Because he was the he he did weekend update. Yes, and he became more manic every week. Poor guy. Because clearly the pressure was building. Now you probably interviewed me. No, when you do, not when no. you were doing that. No, because someone interviewed me who was writing something about Charlie Rocket for. No, Playboy. it was probably Josh Carp, the uh, author of this book. Yeah, I got Karp. the gig from Josh. It never. Josh, yeah, they decided against it. It was after he cut his own throat. Yeah. And uh, did he, I mean, I know he had a sort of, I mean, he had worked with like the B-52s and uh, TV Party, which was that uh, avant-garde uh, cable access show with Glenn O'Brien. I know he was part of that crowd, but um, but I was just curious what he was like, because I know Gene, he was going to be the star. He was a sad first. End. Yeah. You know who's friends with him? Joe, pa uh, Joe Pantoliano. Oh, really? Yeah. They, they were tight. We talked about him on this show. And actually, he became a decent actor. In fact, in Dances with Wolves, yeah. he's actually really good in that. In Earth and, Girls and Are Easy, too. Yeah. The yeah. funny thing is, is they say, you know, because he said fuck on the well, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charlene Tilton. Fuck it, was said a billion times on Saturday Night Live, yeah. but they don't notice it the other time. But they said, oh, and with that, that killed his career. And no, it didn't. Got him fired. He was in Dumb and Dumber and a bunch of other shows. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bunch of movies. He was on 30-something. I mean, yeah. He, he did a lot of stuff. He, he was always popping up in TV and movies. Well, he had a good look. Yeah. Uh, he was very photogenic, very telegenic. Um, of course, when Eddie emerged, I mean, that was, I mean, that, what, what did you guys think when Eddie first up? Were you jealous? Like, because he was getting all the attention all of a sudden? Were you happy because he was saving the show or seemingly saving the show? Yeah, what was I, that like? Did you know him from the clubs? I, I I didn't know him from the clubs. I may have run into him once mm -hmm. or twice. I know he's at the comic strip. He I was, yeah, yeah. I I didn't really run in because he was mainly like a Long Island comic, mm -hmm. and he was in some. Uh, I think he was in a team called uh, Identical Triplets. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, he was with Nelson, Bob Nelson. Yeah, Bob Nelson. Oh, Bob yeah. Nelson. Yeah. Yeah. Was yeah, in sure. it. He was yeah. a part of a trio. And I get wow. the third guy as I forget everything. Was it, it wasn't Dave Hawthorne. Was I think so. The Walrus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's now, an you're odd going, You're going back to Long Island Comedy Club. Days oh yes. Now. Bob Nelson, the guy who did the punch. Jiffy drunk. Jeff. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did Jiffy. the boxing character. Yes. Yeah. yeah, punching himself. He worked in the head with a team with Eddie Murphy. Yes, that's an odd character. Was 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 Rose was in Roosevelt. He was a wow kid. What was We're, that, Governor's Comedy Club? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, East Side Comedy Club in yeah. Huntington, trying things out in, in local joints. Yeah, yeah. Before but, he ever broke out. I myself, maybe I just totally blanked out on it, <laughs> but I I didn't notice anything about Charles Rocket that would lead me to believe he'd ever do something like that. He yeah. seemed, I I fell for the... Kind of loose, joking around guy. In fact, years later, I was on some, I, I did an appearance on a sitcom. And I was cast there. I was supposed to be a guy who was jealous of his brother. And my brother was played by Charlie Rocket. Oh, really? And we hadn't seen each other for years. And... And I remember it was out in L.A., and we were happy to see each other. We joked around and kept talking about old times. And he invited me to his house for dinner, and that was fun. He had a wife and son. And, yeah, I I didn't. Who boy, knew? Boy. A sad turn of yeah. events. I mean, and that's an angry way to go out. Absolutely. Oh, my God, yeah. Absolutely. Cutting your own throat with a box cutter? Absolutely. That takes effort. And, and that means it's not one of those, you know, bullshit, I'll make a little cut on my wrist. Cry that, for help. Yeah, yeah. This was not a cry for help. No. This was, I want to kill myself, and I want it to be as painful 
to me as possible. He said fuck on SNL, then he said fuck to life. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think there's another book in the 12 episodes, Dennis, in Gilbert's, in Gil, in Gilbert's short run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm the, I'm the guy to write it. Absolutely. You know, you, you know that. Absolutely. Uh, Gil, you should see the movie. Yeah. A futile and, and stupid gesture. And, and can I just say real quick, because in case anybody who's associated with the film is listening to this, in fact, I know some will hear it. Um, I, 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 you know, I appreciate what they did. Me too. I, I, I wasn't part of it at all. Uh, I was part of the book, but not the movie. And um, I'm glad it's out there. My vision of The Lampoon as a movie, first of all, I, I, I see it as like an HBO miniseries, like five episodes, because you really have to get deep into yeah, it. Yeah, the documentary did a good job. It, it did. Again, it graced the surface. Mm -hmm. The thing is about The Lampoon, it's, it's, it's not a comedy story. It's a drama. It's actually no. a very dark, dramatic story. These are very damaged people were brilliant and they were at the right place at the right time culturally and comedically yeah and the, and the movie doesn't quite capture that no it doesn't it, capture it, it, at all in my it, opinion it, it treats but. them a little bit superficially maybe because there's a lot of characters or there's a lot to get to and but it's really kenny's story yeah it's, it's not so much the story it's of the a film. lot of anachronisms too yeah i mean o'donoghue is dressed in 1970 yeah like he'd be I dressed in 1979 you know yeah. Yeah. Hey, the dark glasses i go wait whoa whoa he but, was a hippie back yeah, then he had but, hair down to here with Wire frames and an old army jacket. It's a it's a hard story. Also, you know, you you you're, you're depicting real people. You know, and I'm watching. And I'm thinking, don't don't have anybody play Rodney Dangerfield or or <laughs> oh, Bill yeah. Murray. And, and they did. And, and they, they did. tried. And it's an absolutely impossible task. No, it's impossible. Um, but but, but I'm I'm ha and there's been talk about a spinoff of the O'Donoghue movie, which I'm, I'm more I hope than it happens. I, which I'm more than happy to see. Uh, I don't know if I'd be a part of it. I you know I'm, I guess I'd be a part of. Some of it, but I mean, uh, Michael. Michael's story is not in this movie. If you haven't seen the movie and you want to know more about Michael O'Donoghue, Thomas Lennon, Tom Lennon, good guy, yeah, did a pretty good job. Pretty, they all did a pretty good. I job. I mean, you know, I mean, he looks like O'Donoghue. I mean, again, from the SNL period, it's just tough. But, it's tough to capture. Was was Henry a consultant? Was anybody who was there? I don't know. I mean, Henry Beard involved? came out. Of, you know, he he came out of uh, retirement to talk about the Lampoon after I was done with all of this. Right, right, right. Because back in the day, he wouldn't talk to anybody about it. He refused. I, I Christopher Surf was as close to Henry Beard as I got. Yeah, and he says, yeah. Henry will not talk to you. He won't talk to anybody. I'm sure. But now he's talking to everybody. So I don't know whether or not he had something to do with it, but the guy uh, who played him, Donald Gleason, yeah. did a pretty good job. Yeah, yeah. The wigs were all fucked up. I mean, the, it was like wig stock, you know. Two, two podcast guests turned up in it, too, Rick Overton and uh, Paul Shear. Uh, wow. Paul Shear is the 30 seconds of Paul Schaefer, which is the most maybe the most <laughs> surreal thing in the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Caddyshack where the, he does, uh, Bill right. Murray does the uh, the lounge singer right. from, Nick Nick the lounge singer from SNL, who shows up in Caddyshack for some reason. But again, a universe where Paul Schaefer exists. Yes. But not Martin Mull. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a, it's a topsy-turvy world. And a trivia question for you, Gilbert. Yes. Uh, Doug Kenny's Wake, which is the last scene in the movie, inspired... What famous 80s movie? I know Dennis knows. That's why I'm asking you. Ooh. Do I know that? Michael Schamberg, Hollywood producer, was one of the people at Doug Kenny's Wake. Right. And he left thinking this is a movie. You didn't know this. I'm blanking. It became the big chill. Oh, right. Yeah. I didn't know that. There you go. <laughs> no, I really didn't know that. You really didn't no, know I that? No, I didn't. I oh, didn't look know it that. up, my friend. Well, hey, Frank... You're my guiding light on this. I mean, you're my you're you're my safety net. You know, if I fall off the high wire, uh -huh. Frank's there. I'm your home call on Millionaire. What are they, yeah, your, you your are. Lifeline? Yeah, absolutely. When I'm on Comics Unbound, you know, you're the guy I go to. So I'm going to recommend Josh's book, A Futile and Stupid Gesture. Gilbert, absolutely. you should see the movie because we'll talk about yeah. it and it's surreal, and we'll have Dennis back and we'll talk more more fun details. And and your book is terrific. Mr. Mike, The Life and Work of Michael O'Donoghue. The man available? who made comedy dangerous. Get it on Still Amazon. Still available. It's, it's on Kindle. And it's in the old-fashioned hardcover and paperback. And, and che Chevy's uh, endorsed it. He called me two days after he read the book, and we talked for like three hours, and he was ecstatic. He says, for the first time, somebody actually got this fucking right. That's nice. And, and, and That's in fact, nice. all of the Lampoon SNL people loved it. I mean, I... Because I was playing off of Wired by Bob Woodward, that book about Belushi, which everybody hated. Yeah. And my book was the no, first one is, after that. Your book is affection. Yeah. Affection yeah. for its subject Absolutely. Well, yeah. I, totally I, well, I, I, some uh, reviewers actually criticized me for that. Said I was just too affectionate to the... And I said, well, fuck yeah, man. These people are giants. There's nothing wrong with that. And, 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 but it's also got criticism in it, too. I mean, it's, it's a good book. Read it. You'll like it. Fuck them.
That's right. Yeah. Gil? Okay. <laughs> well, this has been Gilbert and Frank's amazing colossal obsessions. And our guest today has been Dennis Perry. Thank, Thank you. you, Dennis. Thank you, man. This, this was, was an honor. Fun. It's an honor. Thank you.